Corey, welcome to the show. Steve, welcome to the show. This is something we've been meaning to do for a long time, but as we head into the Christmas season, we got a little free time, and we finally have a time to sit down and record one of our conversations, which I think uh, hopefully the listeners will be happy to hear about, and we're just going to talk about a few topics that we find interesting. That's right. Stuff that we think has been in the news quite a bit. So um, what, what I'm going to do is, uh, I think what we agreed to do is I'm going to introduce you to the viewers, and then you're going to introduce me, All right? and we can ask each other a few questions just so they get to know uh, about us a little bit, who, who's actually on the show. So I'm going to start with your sort of CV bio kind of information, and if I get something wrong, you just correct me, okay? I'm going to start from your childhood all the way through uh, today. Okay? Press that you know it. <laughs> all right. So grew up Amherst, Massachusetts. That's right. Age 16, started Amherst. 15. 15, started Amherst. Math major for a while? Math major throughout the whole time. Throughout the whole time. Physics major for a while. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, He's a physicist. Yes. Um, (laughs) And then it was off to MIT. That's right. Where you studied linguistics. That's correct. Okay. And then from MIT, it was to Stanford, PhD in philosophy, and is it correct to say philosophy of language? That's right. Okay, philosophy of language. So then you became a professional philosopher. Faculty appointments, University of Washington, University of Maryland. Then you realize something. Now, is it too strong to say you realize what you had been doing maybe was BS or you weren't happy with, <laughs> you, you, didn't, you, didn't think that, you didn't think you were going to make progress on the questions that you were interested in through purely philosophical means? Is that fair? Or? I, I guess I began to lose faith in what I was doing is a probably better way. So I would it, just say it's, you found out it was BS or you, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it wasn't for me. It wasn't for you. Okay. So then you did something really heroic, which I, when I tell my other friends about you, I always say this about you, that you know, in, in fairly well into your life, adult life, you made a career change where you said to understand the mind. I think your whole purpose this whole time was to understand the human mind, right? So to understand the mind better, you decided you really wanted to study the workings of it, the neuroscience of it. And so you somehow got admitted to the lab of a Nobel Prize winner at Columbia in neuroscience, where you did your second PhD. Am I, am I correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. And uh, you are one of the world's experts on color vision in Drosophila. Am I, is that correct? Or Yeah, I think I know a fair amount about, um, I guess... I'd say chromatic vision, because it's actually not clear they have color vision. They've got something on the borderline. Got it. it. Okay. But you lovingly caressed in a dark room hundreds of fruit flies? Oh, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of fruit flies. spent five years in a windowless room counting fruit flies. Okay. And all in the service of understanding the human mind. Yeah. My view is you want to start uh, with something you could actually understand, a sort of simple system. And that may be the best way to get a window into a very complex system like humans. And so that's what attracted me to flies. And uh, the idea is that flies would be a kind of almost mechanistic way of understanding something that's very not mechanistic when you get to the level complexity of humans. Excellent. So I just went through that to establish your scientific and humanistic chops. Um, and I, I'll just mention briefly that you spent some time at McKinsey as a consultant. So you've seen the inner workings of the business world as well. That's right. And you've also uh, been involved in technology startups, so you've seen a lot about technological innovation, business model innovation, things like that. Okay, so in a sense, I would say you have one of the broadest backgrounds, intellectual backgrounds of anybody I know. Call it broad, you could call it random. Yeah, I, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be positive. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, now, a couple random things about uh, you that I know is that when you were an undergraduate, we were close friends with. David Foster Wallace, one of the, I would say, leading writers of the 20, late 20th century in America. That's right. Yeah. Dave was a good friend in college. That's right. So hopefully in a further later podcast or, or, or video cast, uh, we'll come back and talk more about Foster Wallace. Sure. Would you I'd like be glad that? to, actually. Okay. By coincidence, I have a good friend uh, when I was at the University of Oregon who uh, did his PhD in English at uh, Berkeley when I was there. And he's writing a huge monumental scholarly work on Wallace and has wow. like already many hundreds of pages. So, um, wow. you know, yeah. So I, 
I, I've read a little bit of Wallace, but I'm not the huge And you've fan. actually, you forgot to mention this really strange quirk of history of how I ended up here. Well, I actually, I wanted to, yeah, before we get into that, I just want to say something about how we know each other. Okay? So we've known each other since... 91? 1990. The fall of... Ni- the fall of 90. Okay. Okay. And um, so almost 20 years, 18 plus years. And... Steve, Steve. What? Almost 30 years. Oh, almost 30 years. Sorry. <laughs> you can't do math. Uh, anyway, almost 30 years we've known each other. Um, and we met on an airplane That's right. headed from San Francisco to Boston. And we were both being interviewed by the Society of Fellows oh, at Harvard. Right. And the lady, this wonderful lady secretary, Diana Morris, who was the secretary at the Society of Fellows, just decided that since we were both coming from West Coast universities, you were coming from Stanford, I was coming from Berkeley, that she wanted to seat us together on the plane so we could chat um, on the way to our interview. That's right. And so that's how we first met, and we talked the whole flight. That's right. It's great. And um, since that, after that, after and you we came, got in and I didn't. That was I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but but um, subsequently, though, hanging out in the Bay Area because we still had time left before we finished our degrees and went off to where we went off. You went to Seattle and I went to Cambridge. Um, I remember whole days where I think you thought the Stanford area was kind of boring, so you would always come up to Berkeley. Um, was, I, Peloton was not hip back then. Yeah, I don't know if it's hip now, yeah, but if you like startups, it's, it's the place to be. But I remember whole days where we would walk around Berkeley, and there were so many big, beautiful bookstores at the time. So this was pre-internet right. days, basically. And the only way to get information into your brain was to walk into Cody's books or Shakespeare's right. books oh, those were fantastic. and just, just spend hours reading. And the you know, the humble book clerk at one of these bookstores had impeccable taste. And so the books that were on display were, you know, brilliant, leading edge books. And so a huge part of my education as a grad student was actually just hanging out at these bookstores. And I remember hanging out with you and just walking through Berkeley on bright, sunny days and uh, just talking the whole time. It was fantastic. Yeah, those were some of the best times. Yeah. So that's what I hope to reproduce on this podcast is us talking with the occasional guest, um, about the same types of things. Some of these questions are still unresolved about yep. consciousness and how the brain works and what's fundamental physics. Um, so hopefully we can have that, those kinds of discussions but now share them with a broader audience. Um, and then I just wanna say, uh, I also remember, I think we met in Madrid and Paris also and, correct. and also right. wandered around there as well. So That's I have right. very That's fond right. memories uh, of you, and um, so anyway, well, let's. My, I'll stop here with my uh, introduction of you. But anyway, I hope to recapture those conversations uh, here, but on the on a video and podcast format. Fabulous! That's astonishing memory, Steve. Um, so, let me give you your biography, as I recall. You grew up in Iowa, Ames, Iowa, Ames, Iowa, and uh, you. Uh, it's interesting. You, you, you. You took a, an interest in science very, very early, so I recall. Um, and your father was a physicist, is that right? Father was an engineer, sure, okay. aeros- professor of engineering, okay. aerospace engineering. Um, wasn't actually, I was always interested in science a little bit, but actually when I was a kid, my parents always used to say that I was going to be a lawyer because I was very argumentative. So okay. every, every discussion at the dinner table, Steve would have to make his point or something like this. So, so they used to kid me that right. I was going to be a lawyer. I remember you describing your father as Spock. Various points. My dad was a very Confucian guy. We could get into that um, whole colorful history of how he got to the United States. So he came to the U.S. in 1948, so before the communists took over. Um, and he was a very serious scholar, kind of his life philosophy was very Confucian. Interestingly, my mother comes from a line of devout Christians, and her family were converted to Christianity by a missionary hundreds of years ago, actually, in China, so I think 1800s. So um, pretty weird, pretty interesting mix of my mom was a very outgoing Christian person and my dad uh, was this very stoic uh, Confucian professor on the kind of very on the nerd, nerdy side. Um, so interesting family. Um, yeah, we should, we, we'd like to talk about Iowa because, you know, I grew up in the East Coast and for people in the East Coast, the Midwest was and still is this incredible mystery. Right? Although you I, live here now. I live here now, yeah. And I'm, 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 arguably, I'm arguably from the Midwest because I was born in Urbana, Illinois. Right. But, you know, our understanding of the Midwest was, was very different. But I do remember that Iowa had the heavy, uh, highest readership of newspapers in the yeah. country. Iowa's an interesting state. And I, I would say that we could, we should, this is another topic for another podcast. But the Midwest for me is a very high trust um, 
uh, you, you can see this Northern European influence here. So Germanic or uh, even in Iowa, it would be very Scandinavian, um, Iowa and Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, so it was very high trust. And for us, the East Coast was very strange. And, and so for me, when I first went, when I went to Cambridge and started spending time in New York and places like that, I was like, wow, this place is kind of a low trust dystopia. Like you can't go up to a random person and expect that you could rely on what they're telling you or that they'll do what they say or, you know, whereas in Iowa, you could. Like many times my, my you know, drunk friends and I would get our car stuck in the snow or something on a Saturday night and a farm guy would like tow us out or something or just do really sort of uh, trust, high altruistic, highly altruistic things. Um, which I think on the East Coast, you'd think the guy would rob you or kill you or whatever. We just had that experience like four years ago in the highway in Michigan. Yeah, see, there you go. You know? There you go. Um, so Yeah, we, we talked about other things about also the size of people in the upper Midwest. Yeah, and people are big in Iowa and, and Minnesota and probably here in Michigan too. You're Compar struck by how short people were on the East Coast. When I, when I, when I went to L.A. and went for college, which I guess you're going to talk about, but when I went off to the coast for college and for work, yeah, I was kind of amazed that people were a lot smaller than in Iowa. So you went to Caltech for, uh, for college. And, I, w uh, I went to a very strange place for college. Which is famous. If you're in physics or in math, uh, these kind of places as an undergraduate or anyone else, Caltech is in some ways uh, as much of a mecca as MIT. And so I recall there's something people say, and I don't know if you told me this or not, but you, you start off in orientation and they say, look around you. Yeah. And there, there are four <laughs> people around you, and one of these four people will not be there at graduation. Is that... Something yeah. That happen? So uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, my friends call me, uh, like to say that I was a Feynman ad idolater because my hero was this guy called Richard Feynman. And um, I, so I went to Caltech largely because of him because I, I learned about Caltech largely because of him. And Caltech is actually now, uh, even more so than before, a very unusual university because they're super committed to meritocracy. So it's basically we want to know your test scores and your grades and you know whether you won some science or physics competition at a national level or something. That's the kind of thing they care about. And um, we're going to admit our students just based on that. And it's a very small class. My graduating class was 186 kids, so it's smaller than my, half the size of my high school. Um, and it's incredibly intense. So there, everybody there has to take two years of advanced mathematics, two years of physics, including quantum mechanics. So even the biology majors, neuroscience majors, have to take quantum mechanics. Um, you could say that's not wise, but on the other hand, you could say, wow, the people who get through that uh, are going to be potentially pretty dynamite scientists. And if you do a study of the ratio of Nobel Prize winners, and if you include, you could even include literature prize or, or uh, economics prize, the, the number of Nobel Prizes won divided by the size of the alumni population. Caltech is, for U.S. universities, number one by a large margin. Um, Amherst actually does very well. We're number eight, I think. Yeah, Amherst does very well. Uh, Harvard is, I think, number two. two. I think Amherst, so, I think we have three. Is it? Uh, uh, we have, one's a physicist, actually. It's a physicist. Uh, it's Carl Woese. Um, and we'll, we'll go into this at some point in time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I went okay. to a weird school. That's right. And um, I think you graduated in three years, right? I graduated in three years because there were no girls there. Uh, the male to female ratio you didn't, was. This is something you didn't tell me. Male to female ratio was five to one. Wow. And I, I, I thought being a naive Iowan, I thought, oh, in L.A., no problem. There'll be plenty of like social life in L.A. And I, I, re I didn't realize until I got there that no, you're, I'm kind of stuck on this little campus, which is almost all male, and we're working all the time. And so I, by the end of my freshman year, I was like, I have two choices. I either have to transfer. <laughs> <laughs> or I have to get out of here as soon as possible. So that's part of the reason I got out. So, I, so I thought it was just purely intellectual that you had kind of... I, I had done a lot of college coursework at Iowa State University, where my father was a professor before I went to college. So I was very advanced, so I could get out in three years. But um, had that not been a possibility, I probably would have transferred. I would have probably transferred to somewhere like Stanford or Princeton. So those were the two other schools that I was thinking of when I went to college. Now, is it right that there's a week at the end of the year at Caltech where crazy stuff happens? There's, um, a, there's a day called Ditch Day. Ditch Day. Which is very famous. And um, the seniors barricade their rooms, and the underclassmen try to break into the rooms. And then once you, if you break into somebody's room, then you can do what's called a counter stack. And so people have done counter stacks, like take apart the guy's motorcycle and put it together, or a car even, and put it together in his room, running or something. You know, really crazy <laughs> stuff. And the stacks come in different varieties. Some are brute force stacks where you, you're literally like pounding on, like a guy bricks up his door or something. Those are actually pretty uh, stupid, actually. But then there are finesse stacks where you 
assign a task to the underclassmen. They have to perform these tasks. We have an honor code at Caltech. And if you successfully perform the tasks, then you get into the room. So it's all honor code. And a famous stack was a math problem that uh, was solvable, but it was so hard that nobody could solve it for, you know, for, tw you know, the day, for the whole entire day. The day lasts like 12 hours or something. My stack uh, was a finesse stack, and it was um, for the students, underclassmen, to go to the Hollywood sign in the Hollywood Hills and change it to read Caltech. Oh, wow. And a bunch of underclassmen, because I was a well-known senior, so a lot of underclassmen were going to work on this project. So they had bed sheets and stuff ready to go and do this. And the press, the LA press, the TV stations cover Ditch Day sometimes. So one of them just said um, to a reporter, they said, oh, what stack are you working on? And they're like, we're going to go and uh, change the Hollywood sign to say Caltech. And uh, this, this lady reporter called the Hollywood Police Department and said, hey, what do you think of these Caltech kids coming up? And the, and the, and the, and the cops said, well, they're going to meet a police car when they go up there. So they, they were foiled. They never got into my room. The next year, the same kids who are now, uh, some of them were now seniors, managed to change the sign. So when I was a first year grad student at Berkeley, I got this postcard. And on the postcard was a picture of the Hollywood sign, but it had been changed to read Caltech. Oh, fabulous. So they executed it on my stack, but they didn't get to trash my room. So, <laughs> so I, I, had the, I had the best outcome. <laughs> There's a similar practice at MIT towards the end of the year. They had some sort of prank. I remember yep. It was, I think it was just before I got there, but someone arranged to dissemble a car, yep. assemble on top of the MIT police dome. car. I think it was even police a police car, car. Yeah, with two stuffed police and they're eating donuts. Yep, it's fabulous. So that's the kind of thing that goes on at Caltech. Right. So after Caltech, uh, you leave and you go to Berkeley for graduate school. Yep, that's right. And there you uh, you you were studying uh, theoretical physics. You as a, for your PhD. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, that time. That was a great time in my life because I was still very young. I, I finished my undergrad degree when I was 19, so I was like a kid. And I deliberately wanted to go to Berkeley because I felt like, okay, I've been cooped up here at Caltech for three years, and I want to go to the, okay, first, it's got to be a good physics, top physics department, okay? But then I want to go to the biggest, craziest school that I can find, and it, that was Berkeley. And uh, which is why we were always walking around Berkeley, not walking around Palo Alto. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I ended up there and I had a great time and um, really um, intellectually it was fantastic because they, they have great faculty there. There's a Lawrence Berkeley Lab is there and um, it's on the larger side for physics graduate schools. So there were a lot of really good uh, classmates that I'm you know, still friends with today or still even professionally interact with because a lot of them are you know, uh, professional physicists now. Um, so I think those were definitely among the, you know, among the happiest days of my life, for sure. It's funny, sure. I mean, I always sense that you were at Berkeley, but not quite of Berkeley. So you don't really see yourself as bohemian. In fact, you describe me as a bohemian. And I'm not a bohemian. You're, makes you think how little bohemian you actually well, are. You're more bohemian than I am. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, like, okay, what, if you got to put yourself back into, like, late 80s America. I had never had an espresso, but, and in fact, there was only one, this is pre-Starbucks, I think even pre, Pete, Pete's Coffee was just getting going, um, which was the inspiration for Starbucks for Howard Schultz, in Berkeley. And so I remember going there in these big, beautiful cafes that were open late at night, and the bookstores, mm -hmm. and so it was a bohemian aspect of Berkeley that attracted me, which actually, to be honest, did not exist anywhere else in the U.S. at that time, I would say. Um, and um, so that, that is what I loved about it. Plus the, the weather was perfect and the, and the light, even the light off the bay, I'll That's always remember. Um, yeah, people don't realize that, but if you drive around the East Bay um, late in the day, you're always getting this kind of reflected sunlight off the bay and it's just, everything is just beautiful. So um, there's a famous, uh, a guy called uh, Paul Graham, who's one of the founders of Y Combinator. He's a famous startup guy. And he has this characterization of what is the, what is the nature of particular cities? And he says like, okay, if you're walking around New York or Manhattan, the number one message you're getting constantly beamed into your head is you should be richer because everything is so expensive here. There's no way you can survive here in Manhattan without a lot of money. That's funny. So you should be richer. That's also and it, right. And if you walk around DC, he says, number one message for you is you should be more powerful because DC is all about power hierarchies. Like, do you, are you in a motorcade? going through town, or are you some schlub who has to go through like security to get, you know. Um, 
in Boston or Cambridge in particular, you should know more. He says, because yeah, the focus in Cambridge is really on pure knowledge, That's right, on yeah. scholarly achievement. And he says in Berkeley, the message is, you should live better. This is the most beautiful aesthetic uh, experience that you can have. It's, and and you, should, you should go to, um, I forgot who the, who, who's the, the famous chef, um, uh, just north of campus. Uh, well, anyway, there's a, there's, a fa there's a very famous chef, Chez Panisse. Mer Chez Panisse is the restaurant. But, but anyway, the, all kinds of things got started in Berkeley, like culinary movement. That's right. Um, uh, cafes in America, good coffee, uh, you know, I'd, European culture. I'd add to that you should also be sort of more open, kind of yes, experimental. Exactly, all exactly. Sorts of yeah. things. So I love that. And, right. and, you know, nowadays it seems like at the time it seemed like the 80s were very distant from the 60s and 70s. But, but now yeah. when I look back, it wasn't that I'm not separate. At all, not and at all. so that culture was still around and there were co ops and food co ops. That's and, right. So, uh, and then there's eccentric characters, right? Remember, yes. remember the basketball man? Yes. Remember the polka dot lady? Yes. I mean, we, and the large gatherings of people sort of with a guy playing guitar in front of Sproul Plaza. And after we graduated, there was a guy called the Naked Man. Oh, that's right. That's right. He was an undergrad who would actually right. go to class naked. Yeah, he came so, to a, he gave a talk at Stanford. And oh, I think the headline, headline was, uh, Andrew Martinez has a small penis. Oh, that's nice. He was quite open about the fact he wasn't showing off. <laughs> okay, I never saw him. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I definitely enjoyed my time there. He would, he would go to class naked in the winter, Wow, really. It was pretty astonishing. I think I wore shorts. The time I was in California, I think I basically wore shorts right. every day. So. It's funny because he, it, it's reminded, I don't know if this is true for Santa Cruz, but Santa Cruz actually had a clothing optional college around wow. that time. So I don't know if that's still around, wow. but it does show you how far things had sort of maintained. Yep. You know, I remember in the early uh, 80s at the University of Massachusetts, uh, my dad uh, uh, taught, um, that there's still these kind of radical kind of left organizations which are really much more popular. They've kind of come back a little bit. These were sort of full-on sort of Trotskyist organizations, some yeah. preaching kind of revolution. And it really was a part of the 60s that continued. Yeah. Um, I mean, kind of parallel to a lot of conservatism that was arriving. It, they still subsisted, but... Yeah, we lived through an era where, well, we lived through Ronald, you and I lived through Ronald Reagan and all that. And now, finally, people are openly talking again about socialism in America. It's kind of, kind of an interesting time. I'm very... It's another thing we're going to talk about more, sure. I think, uh, where we think America is going and, and where it's been. That's one of the fabulous things about getting old, is that you can look back at things. That, yeah, you, uh, have a, you have a well of experience that you can yeah. draw back on. In some situations, I think we're seeing now, we've seen before, and we kind of know how it's going to play out. Whereas if you're a young person, you're seeing it for the first time, you have no idea how this is going to play out. It's interesting. I had a conversation with a friend of mine. This was when uh, Hugo Chavez first came to power in Venezuela, and his response was, uh, uh, I've seen this movie before. Yeah, exactly. And this was like, you know, 13 years ago. Yeah. So, so after Berkeley, uh, you know, we go on the plane flight. We go on the plane, plane flight. flight. We um, get interviewed yeah, by I, these I have this, senior fellows have at this, Harvard. I have a disastrous interview at the, at the Society of Fellows. And it was, I'll just, we'll describe it at some point in time. But um, anyway, you had a very good interview. And it was pretty clear, even by the dinner that night, that you were likely to get admitted to the so describe I, that dinner. Do you remember that dinner? It's funny. I don't remember the dinner that well. Oh, interesting. I, what I really remember strongly is being in my apartment in Berkeley and getting a phone call from them saying that uh, I was going to be admitted to the Society of Fellows. And that, that was like a... Now you were moment. kind of placed at the center of this very, sort of very large kind of... Uh, almost huge a, oak table. Huge oak table, yeah. exactly. And people yeah. kind of coming and talking to you. And I was kind of pushed over to the corner <laughs> here. Okay. I, was, I, was, I guess I, was, I didn't notice that. Yeah, I was, I was, I was actually sitting with... with a very famous philosopher, Quine, but I think... I, it was like a tree. Yeah, exactly. It was, but, you know, anyway, I think my answer is... It was, I was le almost on the way out of philosophy at that point in time. So uh, I think, you know... But, but it was clear at that time. I was very happy when you, when you got the call. So your years... You were there in uh, Cambridge for, is it three or four years? I was actually there for a little over three years because I had this other fellowship from the Super Collider. At the same That's time, right. they were building the Super Collider thing, and they gave me a, a fellowship. So I actually got... What very few fel most junior fellows don't want to leave, because you have no responsibilities. You have a travel budget, no responsibilities, and you can do whatever you want. So it's like heaven. It's like being at the Institute for Advanced Study or something, uh, and you're right in the middle of Harvard. Um, and instead, you you might become an assistant professor at some godforsaken Midwestern university. <laughs> that that would be the, like where you're leaving for. You know? So uh, people don't want to leave. So I got to stay a little bit longer because I had this extra fellowship. Um, and I lived in Dunster House, which is one of the river houses, and I had an apartment there, and it was mostly undergrads, but there were, Harvard has this 
uh, tutorial system. So there were a lot of older people as well, the tutors uh, who lived in the house. So it was really a very vibrant social situation. And I really got to see what does the world look like to a Harvard undergrad, Interesting. which gave me, I think, a lot of insight about elite culture in America and what is the path into Goldman Sachs or the path into McKinsey, all these things. I think you would never understand those things if you hadn't had that experience, That's even at Stanford. Sure. I think even at, at Caltech or Stanford or MIT, you don't understand these things. But if you spend time at Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, you get a sense of what the track looks like. It's interesting because at that time, you know, Stanford hadn't actually come up as far as it exactly. has now. So now it was, it's different. Yeah, things yeah. are still dominated by yeah. those East Coast Ivies. Yes. Um, yep. So um, after the junior time at Junior Fellows, you went to Texas for the... No, they the, killed the Super Collider. You, see, which, you never went there yet. No, I've never actually visited it oh, because, really? because the Congress defunded it. That's right. So I had this fellowship for the, to, to do research related to the Super Collider. Uh, and then the U.S. just backed out and just, just there was this huge tunnel, partially dug tunnel under the ground and they, right. they actually filled it in. And so um, it but, was actually a very bad time to be in particle physics because of that. So I think there are a couple of complex things happening at the time. There was, they killed the super collider. At that time, the Soviet Union collapsed, right? Yeah. And, yes. And I, we can talk about this. I was actually there uh, during that week in, in Moscow. But... So I, I was here to receive the hordes of world-class I was going to say that, exactly. Who, who left the Soviet Union and all took jobs in the United States Please. at exactly the time when I was applying for jobs. So, <laughs> so it, was very, it was a boon for U.S. mathematics and physics, but no it's very question. difficult if you're on the, uh, no the job market. You know, the only thing that ever that rivaled that was when all the Jews escaped Europe under Hitler and staffed all our universities. So what brought the U.S. from total backwater scientifically to world leadership sure. was those em immigrants. Interesting. And it happened again. The Soviet Union had, if anything, a bigger scientific infrastructure, being a socialist state. You yeah. know, you, of scientists course. are cheap. Uh, they had, if anything, a bigger uh, scientific infrastructure, especially in physical science and engineering, than the United States. And they all came here. So it was, a, it was tough for young physicists at that time. But so that's why I'm very sensitive about immigration. No, I can, I can. When people say immigration doesn't hurt, native-born people or people who are from the United States, it's not true. It's actually 100% not true. What's interesting about your case is people, I think, often view it as having affect people who are sort of lower income or sort of, they say jobs Americans don't want. But you're actually describing something high happening to stuff. high, about as high end as you get. Right? High end stuff. But you know, when we're now coupled pretty tightly to a billion people in India, a billion people in China, and their intellectual elite are all trying to come here, uh, tell me that does not affect the prospects of a bright kid from Amherst trying to get a top faculty job. Of course it affects that kid. But also you can say it also positively affects the U.S. economy since we have yes. incredible it's talent a, pool. It's, it's a double-edged sword. Helps That's the U.S. economy, hurts certain classes of Americans. Sure. Yeah, and this is going to be consistent themes. Think we both see that yeah. many, many issues, many phenomena are double-edged swords. Right. And often people on one side of the spectrum Correct. will only view one side of the sword Correct. and not see the other side of the sword. Correct. I, I would say my biggest disappointment about academia is actually how not particularly rational and balanced is the reasoning that we find in our colleagues. So they're, they're not often aware of the best arguments against their positions. Um, and we'll just adapt, just fall into line and adopt some party line kind of uh, view. But I guess I think that's not different than many people, right? I think many of us exist in cultures where the people around us and since our interests, for example, align with one particular point of view and there's not a lot of pressure to adopt the other point of view. I have to say, right. you know, people tend to adopt the other point of view when it's absolutely critical to be accurate. Right, correct. And so, you know, when truth really matters, people often see both things. You know, one of the, um, we'll talk about this a little bit. You know, one of my favorite anecdotes about Einstein was, it was really partly made him so great, is, Einstein loved to argue, like a lot, a lot of you know, act, intellectually active people. And you'd be arguing with Einstein, with his friends, you'd argue with them, and then about some ta topic very passionately. And then they'd realize halfway through the argument, he'd switch sides. Yeah. He was arguing the other side. I, I absolutely think if, I think, was it Goethe or Mill? I think Mill said something about this. If you don't understand the other side's arguments, you know little about your own argument. That's right. So, and I totally agree. Right. And I think one of the topics that we're both interested in is rationality or epistemology. How do people come to the views and the confidence levels they have in those views? Right. And what is the right way to do it and what is the wrong way to do yeah, it? What's the best way probably to kind of get at truth in a very uncertain world? Right. And what kinds of systems in force people to use good epistemology right. as opposed to bad epistemology? What's interesting is, that, is you find people, Einstein, who just, he had this view which was he wasn't committed to anything. Yep. And, that, and he would simply argue every perspective he could until yep. he just adopt the strongest one, which is often some combination. And right. it was that flexibility, I think, you know, 
that often allowed him to be as creative as he could because he simply could get outside of an existing paradigm yep. and, and view it from a very different yep. way. Like Spock. Like Spock. Yeah, a little like Spock. Exactly, exactly. Um, so let's, let's, let's finish your bio. After, um, after the super collider collapsed, <laughs> or the, you know, imploded, <laughs> yeah. um, then you, you're off to Yale. That's right. My first faculty job was at Yale as an assistant professor, and um, that looks good, right? You were you went to Harvard, you were at Harvard, and then you went to Yale, so that's pretty good. Um, I always viewed it as being sent down, because Yale is a kind of no offense to Yale, he's out there in the world, but Yale's kind of a pale imitation of Harvard. Let's just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say that, Yale. This is, this is yes. Steve. Yes, we'll be saying this a lot. I'm, ta- I'm, I'm taking the heat. Like, I will take the heat for what I, I say. I just have a sign yeah. which just says basically. Yeah. yeah, no, you could just, it, yeah, I'm not attributing it to you, but I, I did spend, I think, slightly longer, did I spend slightly longer at Yale? About the same time, so I was a professor there for about three and a half years, um, and um, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed living in New Haven, and I had a lot of good friends there, but um, definitely there was, a, there was a difference between Harvard and Yale, I feel, and um, I, I, it's true to say that Yale has more of a humanities focus, a little bit less of a science focus. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I, I enjoyed my time there, and yeah. So this is actually one of the active debates in academia this, this time about you know Yale's trajectory over the past twenty years or so. Down. <laughs> well, well, many many schools have made a big bet right on science yes. to a large degree, and yes. Harvard, in fact, has developed an enge- built an engineering college. Correct. Stanford's built itself up through yep. technology yep. primarily. Yep. And Yale took a very different path. Yep. And uh, they're paying for it. You know, I think even schools like small liberal arts colleges, where I'm from, um, I think um, people really realize it's extremely important to have both, for anyone who graduates, have both a technical and humanities background. I think that's where the, the power actually comes. And we sort of share this, right? It's good to have sort of a humanist perspective and a scientific yep. perspective. I agree. Um, but uh, so you were, you were at Yale for a couple of years. Now, it's interesting. It's funny. We would lost touch for a little bit, but I think, I can't think of when I first was listening to you on the radio, this was after you left Yale, and I'm listening on the radio, and I'm hearing about Triangle Boy, and you're on NPR. <laughs> yes, okay, good. And I, and I, um, is, was, am I aware that this started at Yale? My, one of my PhD students at Yale and I started a company. What year was this? This was the end, about the end of the 20th century, okay. so late 90s. And it was when the internet thing was happening. And we, had, uh, we were setting up some inexpensive Linux workstations at the time. That was like yep. a new thing. And um, they were immediately broken into. They were scanned and broken into by a hacker, you know, probably halfway across the world. And we discovered this. They saw we, this valuable physics. All these well, they just scanned everything. In those days, there were no firewalls. There was no, people were just scanning constantly networks. And if they saw that, oh, hey, this particular distribution of Linux has this vulnerability, I'll just attack it right away. It's automated. Yeah. And... Um, that the hacker had installed uh, a packet sniffer, so he could see all of the internet traffic within the physics building. Uh, and we were playing with the packet sniffer, and we could actually see. I could see what the other grad, the grad students in the lab downstairs were looking at Playboy magazine or something. I could actually sniff their packets and see what they were doing. Um, so my student and I realized, wow, we both thought the internet was going to be huge. We realized security is basically completely nascent. It's not been developed. All these technologies that are common now, like firewalls and things like this, had not been developed then. Encryption wasn't really well understood. So we decided we would start a company. And that was partially why I left Yale to go to the West Coast. I took a job at the University of Oregon. Eugene, which is another kind of hippie town, actually, um, it's like a small college hippie town in the, in the woods, in the, in the forest. It's an hour flight from Silicon Valley. And so you could conceivably be a professor, but also run a startup in Silicon Valley. Um, because you could, there were like five flights a day. This is, you know, big, the bubble was huge at that time. So there, sure. I think there were like five or six flights a day from Eugene Airport uh, to San Francisco. And so I, I, I moved west. My student and I did a startup, and the startup was, uh, first it was in Berkeley, and then we moved it to Emeryville. So, and it was staffed by, I think there were a dozen PhDs in physics in that startup. So, so it's interesting, the, the product I heard about was fascinating, because it wasn't pure security. You were actually helping people in China hide their tracks from the Chinese government by bouncing their signals off yes. a third party. So we built all kinds of fancy tools, and one of our early investors was the CIA venture fund called Incutel, and a lot of these technologies went into the CIA, but we built a very lightweight piece of code that anybody could run on their computer, and it would allow packets to be rerouted through that machine, 
So you could make the, the Chinese government was just setting up its firewall. Uh, and you could make it look to the Chinese government like um, this person in China was just looking at, you know, communicating with a computer uh, in your house or maybe at some university, but it was reflecting the packets so that it could then load like the New York Times or BBC or what it's, you know, whatever banned content uh, they couldn't get in China. And so the, the, we had this thing called Triangle Boy, which would route the packets in a triangular path. And it's funny that you still remember that because in, in the hacker world, there's still some people who remember that is like being one of the coolest things developed in the early internet days. But most people now have no idea what that is. Did that get also absorbed into the CIA? Yes. Interesting. It's funny because on, on one of my, this is another one, my, my college roommate um, was, uh, he's a very interesting character, Miller Maley. He, uh, he started Amherst at 12, graduated at 16, and went to MIT. Um, actually, he got two PhDs, one in uh, comp sign and in Princeton, he got one in math. But um, Miller sort of disappeared into the NSA at yes. some point in time. Not just yes. his code, but actually the physical Miller. Yeah. So if you Google him or run around, you there's no trace. Well, there's like a there's like this obscure institute, and then like there's you can find like this weird like it's like a laundry list of emails. It's like a web page sort of circa, you know, they were really primitive web pages. Yep. Um, anyway, you can find his email on there, and that's when I uh, last touched. Yeah, so NSA them. is, I th at, at least at one time, it may still be the single largest employer of mathematicians. So there are a ton, there's a huge accumulation of really smart guys at NSA, and they're extremely strong. Um, at CIA, not so much, but CIA is better now, but at the time, they were really behind. They're being rival. I think Microsoft was making a similar claim that they... It could be. It, um, it could be. But uh, so, so this startup, uh, you eventually sold it to Symantec? That's right. For $20 million? $26 million dollars. in cash. Wow. And you had some interesting claim. I remember, I think I ran into you or just afterwards. We were talking about the stress you had towards the end of the yes. sale because yes. you're saying people's interests start diverging. Yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. If you've ever done a startup, um, you, you, you quickly get educated in a whole bunch of things like microeconomics sure. or um, game theory. And so this is a game theory observation that for the founders and the people in the startup, while the startup is running, everybody's interests are m mostly aligned. You have these almost worthless shares in the company, which only become worthwhile if the company becomes really successful, um, and you, you're getting, you're paying yourself below market salary. Okay, so everybody's interests are aligned. The team has to win, the company has to win. Otherwise, none of us win. The moment your company is acquired by, say, a public company, then everyone's going to cash out. Somebody's going to get the plum job within Symantec, and somebody's going to get kicked out. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, I wasn't really involved in that because I wanted to go back to being a professor. So I wasn't actually I was actually at the uh, back already at, at the university when the company got acquired. So I wasn't involved in that. But I saw the guys on my team all, you know, instantaneously stab each other in the back the moment the incentives became disaligned. And so that ha and it's a it's a cliche. Every it happens at every startup. I think you also talked about um, having to fire somebody, which is not something that many professors and how difficult this was for you. The most emotionally difficult thing I maybe have ever had to do in my professional life. Um, I won't talk about my personal life while we can talk about it, but uh, um, was there was a point in time when the NASDAQ bubble really popped. Uh, it was actually soon after our startup was funded and we realized we we're going to have to conserve cash. And we had bulked up. Uh, we had a lot of employees, some of whom were actually old People that I had known for many years who were physicists that I had hired. One guy from Los Alamos. He had been at Los Alamos, and we he wanted to leave Los Alamos, and we brought him into the startup. A bunch of guys like that, and we had to downsize. We had to fire about ten people. And um, I remember it was a beautiful sunny day right on the bay because our offices were overlooking the bay um, from Emeryville, and we we had and you know it's funny when you're in, when you're a startup guy, it's so much more high degree of complexity and difficult. Uh, more difficult than being a university administrator because you never have to do anything like this as a university administrator. So we had to fire about you know a pretty good chunk of our team. And how do you do that? Because if you start calling people in one at a time to a conference room, because the firing process is quite complicated. You have to get them to sign a uh, you know, non-compete, a release, and all these other things. There are a bunch of legal things that have to be hashed out. Um, if you start doing it one at a time and people in the office see what's happening, all hell can break loose. So we actually took these guys out of the office and we fired them out in the sunshine under some palm trees, you know, near the near the entry uh, of the building. And um, I'll never forget that because one of the guys who was an older guy who actually had kids and I had pulled him out of physics to do this startup, he started crying. 
And I just said, you know, and this guy's now a successful person in the IT industry, but at the time his future was very uncertain because he had left physics and this was his first tech-related job. And I just said to the guy, I said, hey, Anupam, it's, it's going to be okay, but I, you know, I, I take full responsibility for this because I brought you here, but I, for the good of this startup, I have to let you go because you're not part of the, the crucial core that we need to keep. But you know, to do that to a friend of yours, is, uh, it's extremely hard. And after that, so you, you sold this startup to Symantec. Um, you've stayed involved in the technology since then. Um, but after that, you, you were at University of Oregon, right? And you got a, um, you started, so, so you started a blog. I guess that's part of the backstory. You started a blog. I started a blog. 2004, uh, I started four. a blog. And at some point in time after uh, uh, your University of Oregon, you get a phone call from a headhunter. Yeah, the thing that brought me to Michigan State, I was actually at a physics conference on black holes and quantum information. Doesn't sound like those two are related, but they're actually related. And uh, I get a phone call from a headhunter. And you think it's a mistake. I thought it was a mistake. I, they said, are you, uh, I'm calling on behalf of Michigan State University. They're searching for a vice president for research. Uh, we're wondering if you'd be interested in a job. And I, I said, I think you have the wrong Steve Chu. You know, like, because there was another guy, there's another guy called Steve Chu, who was a Stanford professor and won a Nobel Prize. And he was the, uh, he was the secretary of energy That's under right. Obama. So I thought, are, are you calling the right guy? Like, what, I, I, you want me to do this administrative job at a university? I'm, you know, I'm. Uh, so, and it turns out I was the person they actually wanted to talk to because they had been looking, they had two Venn, two sets, and they were looking for the overlap in the Venn diagram between strong research background and knew something about startups because they were, they were trying to build up their tech transfer capability here at Michigan State. And believe it or not, in that little intersection of, of those two sets, uh, there were not that many people. Um, and so that, that's how I ended up here, actually. So you're back to the Midwest. Um, back to the Midwest. Midwest. Back where things are normal, comfortable. Uh, I, I have kids now. And so for me, I feel like the biggest thing is that they're getting the same kind of, I think, for what was for my brother and myself, super positive um, uh, childhood. Youth, childhood, no tension, no stress, no driving an hour you know, to go to your soccer game in L.A. trap, you know, none of that stuff. They're just uh, really just enjoying it, and they're in, I think it's a very positive environment for them. So uh, I, for me, going coming back to the Midwest was not a problem. And this is the, the point. Well, tell me exactly when. When was it you began to sort of move out of physics and got interested in, you got interested in genomics? I was on sabbatical in Taiwan in 2009 or 10, and... I was reading an article in The Economist. I, I, I guess I, my, I was writing my blog at the time. So I, I, I had read this article in The Economist, I think, that showed the decline of cost of genotyping. And it was a super exponential kind of Moore's law curve. And I had been interested in evolution and molecular biology and stuff like that when I was at Caltech. But I kind of realized, like, after taking a few courses, I realized, like, these guys, the technology is so weak that they're so far from answering the fundamental questions that I'm interested in. It's, I'm going to stick to physics. But after I saw those, that curve, I said, well, let me just extrapolate this 10 years. I've got 10 more good years in me. <laughs> let's, let's extrapolate 10 years. And if this curve continues, uh, what will we be able to do? And I realized, oh, my God, all these interesting problems that I never dreamed I would be, we would be able to solve in my lifetime, we're going to be able to solve. And that's how I got interested in uh, genomics. And I, I actually reached out to this big lab in China, which at the time was, had the most sequencing power of any lab. It's called BGI. And uh, because I was in Taiwan, they said, oh, come over. And so I came over and gave a, some lectures on what I, you know, the, the sort of the math behind what would show that certain things were going to be possible once we had enough data. So I went over there and gave those lectures, and that's how I got involved. That's really interesting you say that you looked at those curves, because I think it's a very important way to begin to try to see the future. <clears throat> you know, many of us are surprised at how technology has advanced over the years. Yeah. But you look at Moore's law, right, going back in the 70s and 80s, you could just see the way computing power was improving yeah. and how miniaturization was going to yep. be possible. Yep. And so I think a lot of the things that we're, we may be surprised by today are, you can't say they're predictable because they're not particularly predictable, but right. at least the possibilities are there. The, the, main, the main assumption was whether that curve was going to continue. And then you have to look at the core technologies and say, is it plausible that they can keep pushing it down or is it they're going to hit some brick wall? Like we, Moore's law has kind of ended now. Exactly, I was going to say that. So, yeah, actually, yeah. so uh, I didn't know for sure that the sequencing Moore's law was going to, the super Moore's law was going to continue, but it actually has. And so uh, now 
you know, there are millions of genotypes uh, stored around the world that can be analyzed. And so uh, the, what, what I had anticipated has actually come true. It's funny, I think way back to my time at MIT when my roommate was there uh, doing computer science, that's when they really began to at least design chips in three dimensions, right? Because Moore's Law in yep. two dimensions is beginning to yep. Yep, begin to run up against a wall. But three dimensions gave them some space. Yep. And I think we can see nowadays they're running against other limits, right, that may yep. bring it to know. It's not a bad run for, you know, a, a No, a it's fantastic. And actually, if you, if you actually ask yourself about the deep reasons why society is different today than when, say, we were in high school, most of it is Moore's Law, right? All of this Internet stuff, the, the cell phone, all that stuff is Moore's Law. So, In addition, well, it's, all, it's Moore's Law and it's yeah, the applications that come out of there, including... Right. The issues we're going to actually begin talking about today, right. which is, uh, but but if you, I just want to say, if you think about it, like, okay, cars are better than like when we were in school. Like in high school, my car would break down all the time, and I had to like actually learn how to like do stuff. Nowadays, your car doesn't really break down, but it's not that much better. You're driving the same point, speed. Yeah. When we fly abroad to Paris, like when you went on your school trip to Paris, you fly at the same speed as we did 40 years ago, but. It's all this compute and information technology that is, is, is orders of magnitude different. I'd say, and sadly, we have very similar missions. I like to fly to Paris quite a lot. The problem is, you know, <laughs> we're sadly pumping out, you know, enormous amounts of greenhouse gas. So that no, hasn't radically no question. changed. Um, yeah. I feel well, bad. now we're aware of it. Yeah, I keep saying, I, the, many of my friends and I are, are, are real advocates of kind of environmental, good environmental stewardship. Yeah. But almost everyone I know takes trips to, you know, Taiwan. They yes. take trips to Bangkok. They take trips to Africa. They take trips to Paris. And it's hard to find something that's... In, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm super green. I drive a Honda Fit, for God's sake. And it's like the cheapest Honda you can buy and the smallest Honda. And I, I recycle everything. I'm, I'm totally, like, I don't even use plastic bottles. I, I, you know. But travel overwhelms all that. If you actually look at my environmental footprint, it sucks. Because I, every time you get on a plane, you actually burn as much gas or you generate as much carbon flying from A to B as if you got in your one-ton car and drove from A to B. So yeah, that's bad. most people are not aware of that. Yeah, something I think we, we have to look at, people like you and me who, uh, yeah. who fly a lot. Well, I, I think telepresence um, will eventually get to the point where you can have the, at least for business purposes, sure. you can have this kind of connection and interaction through VR. When, when we reach that tipping point, then that's interesting. a lot of business travel will go away. You know, it's funny, one of, one of what our sayings in this office is that uh, big primates like to interact face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So we have in-person meetings, we talk directly, we're in the same room right now. Yeah. Um, but maybe VR may get to the point where you can almost so that simulate that point. experience. In, in the startup world, we often say apes have to sniff each other before they'll sign a deal, and basically. I mean, there's something about our wiring that you feel like you know the person better if you had a face-to-face -face meeting, maybe had a drink with them or something. I don't know that it's actually true, but psychologically it's true. Like, can you really predict their behavior better sure. after a one or two hour face-to-face -face interaction compared to like three hours yeah, of Skype? Yeah, question, yeah. It's not clear to me, but it, we think that's true. We well, feel that's true. We'll definitely find out about it yep. in a few years.